Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, these introductions, I always see my life flash in front of my eyes. Uh, so now I'm here. <laughs> I would like to begin my remarks this afternoon with the Garrison Keeler story. I encountered it on Prairie Home Companion several years ago while driving home late on a Saturday afternoon after a full day of church meetings. I tuned in just at the beginning of Keeler's monologue when he was reminiscing about what it was like to grow up as a good Lutheran boy in late World Dawn, and especially about the curiosity good Lutheran boys had concerning what went on inside the local Catholic Church, Our Lady of Perpetual Responsibility. <laughs> There were strange things that came out of the windows there, things that are not at all nosy, but simply carefully observant, good Lutheran boy, could hardly fail to notice. For one thing, there was incense, smoky and sweet, drifting out here and there, as if some holy cloud had been trapped inside the church. And another thing coming out of those windows, and no less mysterious, was a sound. The sound of chant. Nothing like good four-square Lutheran hymns that made you want to stand up and march, but sort of flowing and sleepy and somehow otherworldly. Then with that great gift that he has for segue, Kilo went on. Chant really isn't that odd, you know. It happens every spring, when Mother discovers that Johnny has gone off to catch the school bus and hasn't taken his jacket. So she calls after him, You forgot your jacket. And he replies, I don't need it. And she uses that real motherly jab You'll catch a cold. And then he responds with the ultimate teenager's rebuttal, but nobody's wearing them. <laughs> and then while his listeners are chuckling, Keeler delivers his homespun punchline. You see, he says, people who know each other well sing to each other. People who know each other well sing to each other. That's true, isn't it? Consider for a moment that little sing-songy style you adopt with your best friends, that lilt you would never use with strangers or in a public situation. You know that little, someone's looking sleepy this morning, boys. <laughs> The one you would be mortified to suddenly have kick in when a professor calls on you in class. Even more than lipstick on the collar, that sort of very familiar tone would raise a few eyebrows. Yet the same energy that singing gives to conversation in order to convey an atmosphere of connection can also be used to intensify a situation of detachment, ridicule, or scorn. Consider, for example, what might have happened if Johnny had worn his jacket. It would have been bad enough if the nobody's wearing the crowd had looked at him and sneered, Johnny wore a jacket. But it would have been ever so much worse if they had broken into that dreaded chant Johnny wore a jacket, Johnny wore a jacket. In our culture, as in many other, that particular musical phrase, na 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 na, repeated <coughs> flatted third, tonic, fourth flatted third tonic, conveys an almost visceral sense of ridicule and mockery. One that is so strong that it completely overpowers any positive words said to it. If I simply speak the words, you have won the lottery, you will be ready to believe me and be very happy. 
But if I make the same announcement as, you have won the lottery, you immediately doubt the truth of what I'm saying and wonder who put me up to playing this Nazi trick on you. The negative music undermines the positive words. This sort of negative and annoying musical phrase is what anthropologists call a taunt song. And such taunt songs exist in cultures all around the world. They were a regular part of ancient and medieval warfare. <clears throat> Perhaps you remember the taunt songs in Monty Python and the Holy Grail. <laughs> and such taunt songs can be found occasionally in the Bible. For example, at the encounter between David and Goliath in 1 Samuel, even some of the Psalms such as Psalm 115, 4 through 8, deriding the idols of other nations, are clearly based on this tradition. When next you read those words, you need to hear them like this. Their idols are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths but do not speak, eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear, noses but do not smell. They have hands but do not feel, feet but do not walk. They make no sound in their throat. Those who make them are like them, so are all who trust in them. Our failure to hear the taught songs in scripture is just one of the many ways that we miss out on the full message of what the Bible can tell us. Not being aware of this unheard music diminishes both our appreciation for and our understanding of the many additional dimensions that words reveal when we hear their music. To begin at the beginning, no one who lived in the eras embraced by the two testaments would have thought that Genesis 1-3 was describing a spoken event. For people who have been taught that it is sacrilege for human beings to give voice to scripture without chanting it, how much more unthinkable it is that the divine source of scripture had not also sung those life-giving words in the first place. So when Genesis 1-3 reads that God uttered the words that created light, that statement needs to be heard as, and God said, let there be light. All those divine commands that punctuate the opening chapter of Genesis, or Psalms, or perhaps even Arias, let there be light, day, night. Let there be a dome in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters, and so on. Our sense of the music that attended creation is further strengthened by the brief creation account that appears in the 38th chapter of Job. When God is making clear how presumptuous it is for mortals to question God's ways, God asks Job, where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? When all the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy. As I constantly tell my technology students, in the beginning was the word, and the word was sung. <laughs> Those songs that stand at the beginning of the record of the revelation of God's loving and redemptive purposes are not some sort of window dressing to entice readers into a boring narrative. Though I must admit that there are a few places like Leviticus and Numbers where things do get bogged down a bit. At times, the absence of the song 
is a means of expressing a sense of the absence of God, as in Psalm 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down, and there we wept when we remembered Zion. On the willows there, we hung up our harps. For there, our captors ask us for songs, and our tormentors ask us for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you, if I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy. But notice that this is actually a song recalling a time when there was an absence of song. For song is not only a means of initiating life, but also a way of preserving life. What we Christians are so prone to ignore and neglect is the way song animates the new, or perhaps more accurately, the renewed testament. Even before the birth of Jesus, there are songs. For example, the Song of Mary in Luke 1, 46 to 55, responding to Elizabeth's greeting. And the Song of Zechariah, a few verses later, celebrating the birth of John the Baptist. And then, of course, there is the spectacular chorus of the angelic choir singing to the shepherds on the Judean hillside, glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom God favors. And when, according to Jewish law, the infant Jesus was taken to the temple in Jerusalem to be circumcised on the eighth day after he was born, his presence evoked yet another song from the aged priest Simeon, Lord, now let your servant go in peace. Over against this narrative inductive approach of Luke's gospel, stands the great philosophical hymn that provides an overture to John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In both cases, song is needed to introduce an event so momentous. These songs that cluster around the beginning of the Jesus narrative are by no means the only musical elements in this story, but many of them have not been so obvious to us. When, for example, early in Jesus' ministry, he returns to Nazareth and goes to his hometown synagogue on the Sabbath, he is asked to read the Haftarah, the reading from the Nidiyam, or prophets, that follows the reading from Torah. He is given the scroll of the prophet Isaiah, and begins to chant, first in Hebrew and then in Aramaic, from the opening of the 61st chapter. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the scripture passage has been completed, Jesus rolls up the scroll and sits down. That is, he assumes the traditional posture of teachers in ancient times. The chanting or cantillation, that is more properly known, would not have seemed extraordinary to those gathered in the synagogue of Nazareth because it was expected and required. What was remarkable is that Jesus launches into a sermon in which he claims to be the fulfillment of this very prophecy. To modern Christian readers, the elements of this story that seem unexpected are the fact that Jesus would have chanted the scripture passage and would have taught from a seated position. 
yet they are perfectly comfortable with the messianic interpretation given to the reading. At the actual event, however, things would have been just the other way around. The chanting of scripture and being seated to teach would have been expected, but the messianic claim would have been scandalous. That there is such a discrepancy between the expectations then and now offers some clue why we fail to comprehend much that is going on in scripture. Because the four Gospels do not include all the same details for the final week of Jesus' life, a piece, occasional pieces of information go missing in our efforts to harmonize these accounts into a single narrative. And it is notable that only Mark and Matthew mention the so-called hymn that Jesus and the disciples sang before leaving the upper room to go to the Garden of Gethsemane. Scholars tell us that what they sang was probably one of the Hallel Psalms, Psalms 113 through 118, associated with Passover ritual. These are also the only two gospel writers who report that the crucified Jesus began to recite the 22nd Psalm. My God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Yet such a sung fragment also appears in Luke's account, who reports that Jesus' final words from the cross were drawn from Psalm 31.5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. It clearly makes a difference to our understanding of our Savior's last day of suffering if we understand it to have been held together with sacred song. In much the same way that we fail to hear the music in Jesus' life, we also miss it in the remainder of Christian scripture. Because nearly all English translations of Acts 2.47, describing the days following the coming of the Holy Spirit, simply read that those Christians were praising God, we do not hear the implication of the underlying Greek phrase that really means singing praise to God. So it does not register with us that in the days after Pentecost, the first Christians were daily witnessing in the courts of the temple, then gathering in their communal dwellings to sing psalms and hymns and to celebrate the Lord's Supper. The centrality of song for early Christians is further indicated by the report that when Paul and Silas were imprisoned, they sang hymns. How revelatory it was to many people 60 years ago when the Revised Standard Version printed all those passages of poetry that had simply been printed like prose in the King James Version. Suddenly, it became obvious that Paul was quoting from an existing hymn in that beautiful opening, in that beautiful section of the second chapter of Philippians that is introduced by let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who did not count, etc. No wonder there are references to psalms and hymns and spiritual songs in the letters to the Ephesians and the Colossians. Before the early Christians began to do the hard work of shaping the early church, they were celebrating in song the meaning of the life and ministry of Jesus. So we find fragments of early Christian baptismal song in Ephesians, and of Christological songs in both the letters to Timothy and in other places. Then as now, these Christians clearly didn't all have the same take on the subject. Paul complains, for example, in his first letter to the church at Corinth, that whenever those Christians assemble, everyone has brought 
his or her own hymn, lesson, instruction, ecstatic utterance, or interpretation. And they all expect their particular contribution to be included. Can you imagine what service planning would be like in your congregation if it depended on selecting for whatever people brought to church on Sunday morning? And if everyone had to remain there until all the suggestions had been accommodated? Good Lord, deliver us. <laughs> Chaotic as all this sounds, however, it is valuable to see that from the beginning, Christian worship was identified with singing both within the Christian community and by people outside it. One of the earliest such descriptions from secular sources comes from a letter that Pliny the Younger, governor of Pontus Bithynia from 111 to 113 AD, wrote to the emperor Trajan concerning the early Christian church and their pattern of worship. He says, they were accustomed to meet on a fixed day before dawn and sing responsibly a hymn to Christ as to a God and to bind themselves by oath not to commit fraud, theft, or adultery, not to falsify their trust, nor to refuse to return the trust when called upon to do so. Even this persecutor recognized the centrality of song in the pattern of Christian worship. It is also notable that the culminating book of the New Testament, in the apocalyptic revelation to John, is filled with songs. For one thing, it reprises the great seraphic hymn, Holy, 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 that centuries earlier had been part of the prophet Isaiah's vision. But it goes on to include numerous other hymns of praise, such as, Worthy are you, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they were created and came to be. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might, and honor and glory and blessing. The kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Messiah, and he will reign forever and ever. Digression. If you've ever sung the Hallelujah Chorus, it's really hard just to read the words, and he will reign forever and ever. You want to stop, and he will go. That's part of the power of music. Unlike the solitary songs of Mary or Zechariah or Simeon, or the deserted Jesus voicing the prophets in the Psalms, the songs of Revelation come from many singers. I heard the voice of many angels surrounding the throne and the living creatures and elders. They numbered myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, singing with full voice. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them singing. The story that begins by God singing the world into being comes to fulfillment when all creation sings back to God and human beings who were created in the image and likeness of God have a responsibility to maintain that original song and to prepare for that final glorious song. In a very real sense, what and how we sing is a measure of how well we are fulfilling this moral imperative. In our society in general, we are not doing too well. Singing with others is not something that most people do anymore. Even in my own lifetime, I have seen this activity diminish greatly. When I was a child, everyone at a ball game or other public event sang the national anthem together. Now everyone stands there in awkward silence while a soloist renders it, a verb I have chosen intentionally, 
<laughs> what has been lost here is not just the active participation of every person in affirming these words by singing them, but also the communal awareness that such singing engenders. Hearing people singing around you is a significant means of recognizing your involvement with lives other than your own, both because of the sonic web that supports you and because of the corporate memory that comes to your rescue when you forget a word and people around you supply it, making it possible for you to keep on going. Yet balancing this general sense of decline of shared public song, or perhaps because of it, I have to report that one of the great signs of hope for me in the dark days following 9-11 came from a most unexpected source. I was standing at my usual bus stop waiting for the second of my afternoon buses when a middle school bus pulled into view. Actually, I heard it before I saw it, <laughs> because all those middle schoolers were singing at the top of their voices. As they got nearer, I realized that what they were singing was not the usual 99 bottles of beer on the wall, <laughs> but the star-spangled banner of all things. They actually knew the words and were singing them together. I was blown away. Unfortunately, that brief shining moment hasn't lasted. And these days, the students on that bus are all cocooned in their iPods or texting on their phones or both. I wish I could report that the situation in our churches were better than it is. There are many congregations that remain vibrant and active and growing by cultivating the use of congregational song but they are no longer regarded as the norm or the ideal. At the very least, they are perceived as being old-fashioned or out of touch. <coughs> the danger here, of course, is that being up-to-date at any given moment is the surest way to be out-of-date for long, especially when being current does not include a healthy attention to the tradition that got you to this place. As Jesus taught centuries ago, a plant that springs up quickly cannot continue to live if it has no roots. Strange as it may seem, I think there, that it can actually be argued that there is too much attention being paid to music and worship in many places today. Such attention is not a healthy celebration of music as a gift of God, as Luther calls it, so much as it is an exploitation of music as a means of increasing attendance or demonstrating that churches are culturally trendy and technologically savvy. The assumption that the musical style of the congregation will be sufficient to provide its identity often has the consequence of neglecting larger issues of faith and witness, both in the overall life of the congregation and in the quality of what is sung. There is also a widespread attitude among many worship planners these days that limits the old cliché that it, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you believe something. The new musical corollary is that it makes no difference what you sing as long as you sing something the congregation likes. In many ways, this is a much more pervasive and pernicious issue than the stylistic disputes that have received considerable attention in both church circles and the secular media. After all, it is just as possible to set a theologically weak text to a 17th century chorale as it is to do so to a rock tune. In fact, the more enamored people are with any musical idiom, the more susceptible they are to embracing words that misrepresent or even undermine the faith of the church. The undervaluing of what is sung results from several misconceptions. The first of these is an assumption that the musical part of worship is essentially insubstantial and decorative and nearly emotive. 
The model for such worship patterns is what I call the worship sandwich. Sing a little, talk a little, sing a little, talk a little, sing a little, talk a little. In this approach, the singing part is viewed as the bread, and the talking part as the meat, the real substance. The great, great irony here is that the music is likely to be the more enduring part. As I like to remind clergy, including myself, no one ever left church humming a sermon outline. <coughs> but how very likely it is that some musical element of the service, especially the final hymn, will linger on their lips and in their hearts and minds all week. It therefore becomes incredibly important to provide this congregation with some musical nourishment that will sustain, instruct, and guide them until they next assemble for worship. A related misconception is that the musical part of the service is supposed to comfort or even entertain rather than challenge. This attitude has resulted in the willingness of some churches to accommodate some very inferior music in the name of being relevant and hospitable. I want to believe that they have done so with the best of motives, with a genuine desire to create a worship environment where people will feel accepted by others and can grow from that sense of human acceptance to know the forgiving love of God in Christ Jesus. Unfortunately, what I perceive happening instead is that people are not challenged to move beyond the culturally familiar and the comfortable into the costly grace that is at the heart of the gospel. In a very real sense, Congregational song that does not address the cost of discipleship is misrepresenting the teaching of Jesus and the pattern of his life. Congregational song that is fulfilling its true vocation is not always going to be comfortable. It does not leave us at ease in Zion. During part of the time that I was an undergraduate at Rice, a friend and I sang in the choir of a black Baptist church. But the Wheeler Avenue Baptist Church was not just any black Baptist church. The choir sang Bach most Sundays. And when we celebrated the Lord's Supper, it was with real wine, not grape juice. Much of the liveliness and vision of that congregation were centered in the pastor, Bill Lawson a gifted poet, a committed worker for civil rights, and also the Baptist chaplain at nearby Texas Southern University. In particular, I will never forget his sermons about why we used wine instead of grape juice. Among other things, he said that we needed to use wine partly because it was dangerous, since too much of it was a bad thing but also because it was full of energy, energy that could be smelled as the warming wine released its fragrance into the humid Houston air. The same thing could well be said about congregational song. We need to use words in music that are dangerous, that do not allow us to feel too self-congratulatory, too safe, we need to be reminded that we are dealing with real and dangerous power, that we are invoking and claiming the presence of God in our midst. Just as worship leaders too often try to tame music into a utilitarian concern, we can also get caught up in an attitude of performance and entertainment that calls attention to us rather than to God. In particular, it seems to me that the increasing experience of applause in worship is one factor that fosters an emphasis on spectacle and performance and diminishes the possibility of an encounter with the transcendent presence of God. In a sense, the act of applauding 
repays the singers and musicians for their efforts and cancels out the need for worshipers to live with a lingering sense of gratitude for what has been offered. It also encourages those who sing or play to expect the instant gratification of approval by the congregation rather than to think of what they are doing as an offering to God. Once the expectation of applause has been established, it is very hard to back down from it. And some people, both clergy and musicians, routinely do things to keep the applause from diminishing. I know one musician, for example, who has his choir do only anthems that end with great crescendo endings, to which he often adds a full down the keyboard glissando as a further signal that applause should follow. Such moments interrupt the flow of the service and diminish the coherence that characterizes good worship. When the time came for my seminary class to receive instruction in officiating at weddings, our professor warned us, you may very well find yourself dealing with the mother of the bride who keeps saying, my daughter wants this, and my daughter wants that, and my daughter wants all the following. In situations like this, he said, ask yourself for whose sake these things are really being done. And I have found that question to be both eminently practical and remarkably profound in many areas of church work. For whose sake is this being done? And the musical aspects of a congregation's life are among the most vulnerable for such pressure. The parents who want the bell choir to play more often, versus those who, of course, want to play less often. The wealthy member who wants his favorite hymn used every Sunday. The budget committee who can't understand why the choir needs to buy more music. And you can fill in the blanks for your own situation. It may well be that these problems at First Church of Competing Interest have been exacerbated by a constant diet of hymns and songs and anthems that are all centered on the self, all celebrating God and me, with the emphasis on me. That sort of repertoire fosters an environment of entitlement, of expectation that one's own interest will be gratified. In short, what a congregation sings not only shapes their sense of their relationship to God, but also their relationship to other people, both inside and outside the church. Another part of the problem is that we too often concentrate all the expectations about music into one hour on Sunday morning, which is a recipe for disappointment as well as a way of playing into the music as decoration mindset. What needs to happen, I believe, is that music ought to be an integral part of everything we do in the church. There should be no church gathering that does not include music, whether that is a Sunday service, a Bible study class, a church staff meeting, a potluck supper, or anything else. At the church I served in Connecticut, we instituted what we call the You Bring It, We'll Sing It potluck suppers. We had just been through the introduction of the new hymnal, and we still had an apple supply of the old hymnal. But we made it clear that we would sing anything, even drop kick me Jesus through the goalpost of life, <laughs> if anyone brought enough legal copies for us to sing it. As it happens, there was a fairly new member of the congregation who had been after me for weeks to sing Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, despite his own admission that it didn't really fit any of our Sunday morning services. But once we sang his favorite hymn at one of those potluck suppers, he never raised the issue again. What I learned from that experience is that his real motivation was not the hymn itself, but a need to feel accepted in the congregation. 
Sometimes a hymn or a song is not just a hymn or a song, but an expression of inclusion. There will probably always be a wide range of opinions within congregations, within denominations, and among denominations about what needs to be sung in churches. I, I hope they can at least be agreed that people need to sing. And not just some of the people, all the people. Just like the people at the ballgame who only listen to the national anthem, so many congregations now gather without singing a single hymn because their singing role has been assigned to a worship team who do it for them. It must be acknowledged that such worship teams often demonstrate considerable musical ability, remarkable dedication, enviable technical sophistication, and genuine Christian commitment. But what seems to be overlooked in the instance after instance is the deep theological and ecclesiological significance of this pattern. Most people seem not to have noticed that this pattern of worship has essentially turned the Reformation on its head. The spiritual descendants of people who struggle and often die in order to ensure the full participation of all believers gathered for worship have, in effect, abdicated their own active engagement in favor of the modern equivalent of a priestly sect. Surely, this is an area where Paul's warnings about the dangers of being conformed to this world need to be heeded. At the same time, Jesus' observation that worldly wisdom has its virtues reminds us that we can benefit from many recent studies that have been made in various scientific fields, pointing to the importance of music in general and singing in particular as deeply significant in human development. For example, it is surely worth keeping in mind that hearing is a primary human sense. The inner part of the ear is the only organ that attains full adult size by 24 weeks after conception. As a result, music can provide the fetus with sensory stimulation, and singing both improves the emotional state of the mother and promotes the growth and development of the baby in the womb. Even after birth, song can help to develop the bonds between a child and her or his caregivers. <coughs> Experts have noticed that babies recognize melodies earlier than they do language, which is why parents traditionally sing lullabies to babies at bedtime as a signal that it's time to sleep. It has also been found that playing music, whether Mozart or something else, and singing to a child promotes language and cognitive development, coordination, and listening skills. A child's ability to retain and memorize can be enhanced when that material is, the material to be learned is connected with a musical mnemonic. How true that is. Many of us, even as adults, still find ourselves reverting to bum, 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 in order to check the order of the alphabet. What I find even more fascinating is the recent research that strongly suggests that human beings sang before they talked. This is an area of somewhat speculative research, but it strikes me as making much sense of human development and human experience. Among other things, it offers insight into the increasingly familiar phenomenon that people suffering from various kinds of dementia, including Alzheimer's disease, can often recall and vocalize words associated with music when they are not able otherwise to speak. This phenomenon has given rise to a remarkable new therapeutic approach that helps patients who have lost ordinary vocal communication skills to regain at least some of them by learning to express themselves in short chanted phrases. All of which brings me back to where I started. 
As T.S. Eliot wrote in the Four Quartets, in my end is my beginning. The singing that happens between people who know each other well is as nothing when compared with the singing of people who know God well and whom God knows well. For singing God's song renews and reawakens us as nothing else can do. Nowhere in scripture are the people of God admonished to sing to the Lord an old song. But if truth be told, that is what most of our congregations want to do. Yet the recurring command to sing to the Lord a new song is not so much about innovation as it is about renovation, about singing to God with a new heart and a new voice. The real priority is not the song itself, but the renewing experience of God that evokes song. Like Miriam and Moses at the Red Sea, like Zechariah when his silent lips were opened, like Mary at her meeting with Elizabeth, so we too need to raise our voices in song to celebrate a new awareness of how God is acting in our midst and in our lives. So I ask you to join me now in singing the hymn you received when you came in as newborn stars in the spirit of song. <coughs> because none of you have sung this before, I, Emily is going to play it through once and then we will sing.
ordinary experience has taught us that human beings do not use flowery language in situations regarding requiring immediate action. If you discover a fire, you do not quietly mutter to yourself in the manner of a Shakespearean model of dialogue. Forsooth, methinks there is a conflagration. Instead, you yell, fire, fire. So it is with the experience of God in our lives. It is not enough just to chatter about it. We need to sing about it. In many ways, the insufficiency of mere speech is an indicator of the intensity and validity of our experience of God's redeeming purpose and of our need to share that good news <coughs> with others. When you mean it, really mean it, sing it. <laughs>